Hey everybody, welcome to ARE Live. Uh, I'm Mark Tier, the founder of Black Spectacles, and today uh, we're going to talk about ARE4. Uh, for those of you who are um, working against the, uh, the clock, which expires on June 30th, we thought it would be a good idea to go back and go through some of the ARE4 uh, exams. So today we're going to go through construction documents and services. Uh, Mike's put together a really nice mock exam with maybe a trick <coughs> question or two. Uh, I, can't, I can't tell you. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Uh, so that's what we're going to do today. Before we get started, um, don't forget if you'd like to attend our next ARE live broadcast uh, where we're going to have a discussion about ARE 4.0, the site planning and design exam. Uh, we'll do another mock exam uh, as well for that. Um, and uh, and uh, this should be a really useful one. You can make sure you go to blackspectacles.com slash podcast to register. Um, during the broadcast, just like today, you'll have a chance to ask questions to the group as well as to Mike. Um, we do have some, um, some product updates, I think, that are worth mentioning today. Um, super excited to let you guys know that we launched our ARE 5 practice exams. Uh, we launched it, uh, I think, a week ago, actually. Yeah, man, it's hard to believe it's been a week already. But um, here's the idea. Um, we call them practice exams, but I really don't think that's fair. It's really an exam simulator. It's designed to simulate the same experience as taking the real exam. Um, we actually you know, worked with, uh, with NCARB to um, to provide as close of an experience to the real exam, minus their questions, of course, um, as we could possibly get. So it's really awesome. Um, we're still filling it up with uh, even more and more questions as we go along. There are case studies uh, for each of the exams in there. Um, it's the same, you know, number of question types from like multiple choice to fill in the blank, all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's going on. You can go over to, you know, you can just go to blackspectacles.com. Um, to check those out for ARE 5. And then also we're launching, or we've, we're in the middle of accepting applications for our group coaching program. Um, and what that is, it's essentially, you know, kind of a preset uh, plan for getting through the exam. Uh, what you do is you're paired up with a coach, someone who's recently passed uh, these exams um, and who has some experience, of course, practicing. Um, and then you're gonna be paired up with uh, folks who are committed to the group and committed to taking the exams, um, you know, on a certain pace. So, for example, you know, maybe you're going to be taking one exam every month, or maybe you're going to be taking one exam every two months. Um, but everyone in the whole group um, commits to taking these exams together and be coached by this, uh, you know, by by our our, our coach, our coaches. And um, so far, we've had a really incredible um, response to to that. We're also looking for coaches, so if you know someone who you think could be really good, who could be a really great coach, uh, please uh, either send an email to me or send them over to our careers page, blackspectacles.com slash careers, um, where, uh, where they can apply to be a coach. Um, so really exciting times. Uh, we have other things that are coming out a little bit later this year, but uh, those are two things that are, that are open and live uh, right now. So um, just wanted to let you guys know about that. Um, as we normally do at the end of today's episode, we'll have a special discount uh, uh, on Black Spectacles individual memberships to share, which of course you could use on those um, ARE 5 practice exams if you like. Um, and then as we like to do when we have a mock exam, at the end of today's episode, we'll choose someone from all the folks who submitted their answers. Um, and then someone will win a free one month ARE prep Black Spectacles subscription. And we'll be tracking your answers. And so. Um, everyone who gets them all right, uh, we'll send you a free Black Spectacles t-shirt. So stay tuned for that as well. My guest today, <laughs> sitting in front of me in a really nice, uh, is that turquoise? Sure. Yeah, really nice blue shirt. Um, his name is Mike Newman. If you don't know Mike, he's an adjunct professor at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. He's also the founder of Shed Studio, and he's the uh, instructor for our Black Spectacles online ARE exam prep curriculum. Uh, and of course, if you haven't already checked it out, um, you know, head over to blackspectacles.com to watch any of our, uh, the free tutorials from any of our exam prep courses. Today we'll be taking questions using the GoToWebinar question box as well as on Twitter using the ARE Live podcast hashtag. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Mike. Okay, so as Mark said, we're going to be looking at the ARE 4 version uh, of the exam and the construction documents and services. 
uh, exam specifically. But you know, it's also good to remember that it's not like there's a different architecture being examined under ARE 4 than ARE 5. It's still all the same basic issues. They're just organized differently. So uh, whether you're taking exam 4 or exam 5, it's, it's all relevant information. Uh, it's just sort of how we package it together uh, in order to uh, really understand what each exam is sort of focusing on. So you have a kind of an idea about what to, uh, what to be ready for. Uh, and I got to say, I love the fact that uh, we've got the uh, ARE 5 uh, exam package, uh, the mock exam up, the um, exam simulator. Uh, my one suggestion is that you also build in some other simulations, like maybe have car trouble uh, outside and get used to having trouble, and then have hire somebody to be your like bouncer at the door who takes your phone and your iWatch and, and any writing utensils, so you have the full, full experience, but then you can... Uh, get very, very close to what it's like to actually take the real exam. So let's jump into our mock exam here. Uh, hang on a second, let's see, there we go. Uh, so this is just, uh, remember these questions are not necessarily uh, kind of the full figure of what questions are really like. It's just to kind of give us something to kind of talk about, but, but it gives you a sense of the kinds of topics that uh, will likely come at you. Uh, so our first one, if the price is the most important factor for the owner, which type of specification uh, would you suggest? And then we have four possibilities, performance, proprietary, CSI, exclusionary. So this is talking about, you know, when you're putting together a drawing set, a, a contract document set, uh, there's always obviously the drawings, the, all the plans and elevations and all of that. And there's also the specification book, which is uh, sometimes referred to as a spec and often referred to as a project manual. The sort of technical term would be a project manual. And the project manual has a spec, but it also has a number of other things in it. But here we're specifically talking about the spe specification. And there's a number of different ways that you can write a specification. Uh, and the question really is, all right, so uh, what would be the advantages and disadvantages of writing it in various different ways? And the, the first thing let's probably do is just sort of get rid of a couple of potential uh, answers here, just to sort of uh, pare it down a little. Uh, let's look at C for a moment. So C is an interesting one, uh, the CSI. CSI is the uh, Construction Standards Institute, and it's uh, the place where the numbering sequence that we use for specification uh, that's where that comes from. So the old school version is a 1 to 16 sections. Uh, the newer version is 1 to 50 sections. They're actually still the same sections, but then they've added some slots for a few kind of future down the road uh, so that everything about concrete is in three, uh, everything about masonry is in four, everything about metals is in five, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so CSI is part of the specification process, but it's not the type of specification. It's a, it's a tool that we use in the specification for people to understand what's going on, but it's not a type of specification. So it's uh, not one of the uh, potential answers here. Uh, and then also D, exclusionary. Um, it, you exclude things in specifications all the time, and it's sort of a term that gets used, but it's not a type. It's, a, it's sort of a part of the process. So the two that are left as possibles are performance and proprietary. And proprietary is the example that most of us are probably pretty used to. You've probably all seen. And proprietary might say, uh, all right, we want uh, carpets uh, in the, this location. The carpets are going to be uh, either a Mohawk or interface. Uh, and if it's Mohawk, it's this type of carpet with this coloring. If it's interface, it's this type. And then there might be two or three or, or more other options uh, that name the specific carpet that you would be uh, willing to accept from the contractor. So those are proprietary. Sometimes uh, have other names, but proprietary is the sort of easiest one to remember, I think, in this context. Uh, so you're naming the specific materials and then the contractor needs to, to get those materials. But here's the kind of interesting thing. That seems sort of the straightforward and easiest, but it isn't necessarily the cheapest it for the owner overall. Because one of the troubles, if you think back to any time you've spent in an office, 
uh, you probably don't have a lot of price lists on all those binders of beautiful materials that the suppliers are willing to give to you. Uh, when they come and they sh give you a little show and tell and they show you all the kind of cool things that they've got, uh, they don't spend a lot of time on the price point. And so architects are looking at durability, at beauty, at uh, does it meet the needs, does it fit in with the other choices. Uh, and they try to have a sense of the price point, but they don't always have a sense of the price point. So if you can write a spec that says, here's the flame spread that we need to meet, here's the look that we need it to meet, you know, maybe it's a, a low carpet or a tufted carpet, something like that. Uh, here's the uh, sustainability requirements that we need to meet. And just sort of list all of the performance aspects that that carpet needs to meet. Then the contractor can find one that meets all of those issues but will be the lowest price for them. They have now an active desire to find the lowest price that meets that performance. And so a performance type spec, uh, which is going to be the answer, uh, a performance type spec is going to be the one that is likely to give the owner the cheapest price overall for the project. However, it also has some downsides. Uh, it creates a lot of work for the contractors. Contractors don't always like that because they aren't necessarily built in. They don't have a lot of overhead uh, sometimes set up for the reviews of this kind of information and all the searching that it takes. Uh, so it does sometimes uh, require a slightly different contract or uh, different kinds of negotiations. But uh, I specifically use this one because as a generalization, as sort of a simplistic view, when you're talking about specifications, performance type specs are generally considered that they will bring the cheapest overall project budget in, whereas proprietary will sort of probably be the easier, faster uh, type of specification uh, in order to bring in uh, the project in a speedier way. Hopefully that all makes sense. Mm -hmm. Let's try number two. Which would be a benefit of a construction manager project delivery for the owner? So first of all, um, just remember that the term project delivery uh, refers to uh, kind of any different way that a project gets, uh, kind of comes into being. So the typical one would be a design bid build. Uh, so that's where the owner, the client, hires an architect, they negotiate back and forth about schematic design and into design development, uh, and then eventually the architect finishes out the contract documents, prepares a bid set, sends it out to a number of bidders, and then those bidders uh, all bring information back. One bidder is chosen, they then become the GC and it goes on to build the project. That's a sort of tried and true, long-standing way to do it, but it also takes a long time and has certain disadvantages. Uh, there are obviously certain advantages to it as well, but it has certain disadvantages. Another project delivery method might be uh, design build, where instead of having that whole separated process, you actually, as the owner, hire one entity. It might be two different companies, uh, it might be one company, but it acts in terms of the, the relationship to the owner as one entity, and it has both the designers and the builders all put together in that one entity. So clearly has a whole very different sort of delivery of the project, it has different contracts, it has different relationships, it has uh, all those aspects are all quite different. So there's a number of these different ways that you can deliver a project. The construction manager concept is another one. So the construction manager idea for project delivery is that the owner, instead of going through the process with the architect and then bidding out to a number of contractors uh, and then getting a GC straight from that, at the same time that they're hiring the architect, they're also hiring a construction manager. So if you kind of think of the construction manager as an employee of the owner, it's not actually technically an employee usually, usually there's some sort of subcontract or something. But if you kind of think of it as an employee, the construction manager, an employee of the, of the owner, there's working for the owner. And then as the architect is doing the designs, the construction manager is helping the owner kind of manage Will this meet the cost they need? Are there uh, issues of construction that would be useful to uh, help the architects out to kind of speed things along? So it's a way of getting that kind of information uh, that the contractor could bring early in 
and it uh, allows the owner to sort of take a little more responsibility for, for the, the project as a whole. So the question is, which would be a benefit of, uh, as a, what would be a benefit of the construction manager project delivery method for the owner? So let's look at the four possible answers. We have a uh, CM, a construction manager, responsible for means and methods. Uh, we have early pricing information. We have lowers the owner's liability. Uh, we have D, uh, can speed up the construction schedule by overlapping trades. So the first thing I can say is it's not D. Uh, it may well speed up the construction schedule, but it's not by overlapping the trades. That would be fast track. That's a very different, uh, uh, completely different uh, project delivery system. Uh, now let's look at uh, C, it lowers the owner's liability. Well, if you think about it, the owner is now being more involved in the design decisions. It is uh, the construction manager is now taking on the responsibility not of being a separate GC, but when the building period comes, they're going to be hiring subs, but in the name of the owner. So they are uh, acting kind of like a GC by the time you get to the construction phase, but they are technically an employee of, or not technically, kind of an employee of the owner. So they're acting on behalf of the owner and hiring all these subs. Well, in sort of out in the world, obviously, uh, if you're the one hiring the subs, you're taking on the liability. So in fact, C is exactly the opposite. Uh, if you're doing a construction manager project delivery, you are actually increasing the owner's liability. So you might wonder, well, why would they want to do this? Why would an owner want to have a construction manager if they're increasing their liability? And the answer to that is, well, you know, the main reason is that uh, if you, you are increasing the liability, it also means you're taking the, the profit of that liability as well. If you think about what a GC gets paid for, they get paid to kind of do all the work, but they're also being paid to sort of take the chance. You know, they say, all right, we'll be able to do this project for a million two, uh, and they come in at a million one, well, they just made an extra hundred grand, you know, because they said they'll do it for a million two, but actually they were able to make it work at a lower number, so they get to save uh, that extra money and hold that extra money. There's a lot of different ways, different contracts will share some of that and things like that, but in general, they get to hold that money. But equally, if it comes in at a million three, they just lost a hundred grand. Uh, so they're taking the chance that the project, uh, that they've figured out how to make the project go. Well, so if the owner is hiring a construction manager, they are effectively saying, all right, we're going to take that uh, responsibility and liability and have it in-house, meaning that if they save the money, they've saved that hundred grand for the owner. Uh, but it also means if it goes to 1.3, well, they've just lost the, the million and they've taken the liability of that for the owner. So. Uh, C is actually exactly backwards. It's uh, not going to lower, it's going to increase the liability for the owner. And then we have A and B left. The construction manager is responsible for the means and methods and B, early pricing methods. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, both of those are sort of true, uh, are, both of those are true to an extent, uh, but the best answer to this question is going to be B. So that seems like kind of a low level answer, but in fact, it's actually really an important issue. If you think about how an architect tries to do their best to sort of do cost estimates and uh, sort of guesses early on in the phases uh, and kind of makes their best judgment and talks to various people to kind of keep the, the project in line with the original cost estimates, but architects are not sort of famous for their ability to do that. Uh, and GCs and construction managers are. That's their job is to be able to put prices to uh, a drawing set. And so having a CM involved, one of the big issues for that is that the CM is able at the first set of drawings that come from the architect, be able to review and start to see where cost implications might be a problem or uh, provide helpful information about what they, the architects could do to bring the price lower. So uh, one of the key things that you get out of a construction manager is early pricing information through
through the project. So B is definitely the sort of typical answer that NCARB uh, would expect in that kind of situation. Okay, here's an odd question. Who signs the A201? A201 is the general conditions uh, contract, uh, part of the contract family of the AIA. So who signs the A201? List all of them. Uh, this would be the part that Mark was referring to and is a little bit of a trick question. So uh, this one doesn't count on the uh, uh, giveaway, giveaway uh, issue. Uh, hope you don't mind. All right, fair um, enough. And I, I do this, they will not give you a trick question on the exam. Uh, the exam uh, will be written very straightforwardly. Uh, they have uh, no desire to trick anybody. That's not what, they're, what the point of the exam is. Uh, I, I did this really just to make it sort of more memorable so you can kind of, uh, kind of hear it a little differently. So who signs the A201? The answer is no one signs the A201. Uh, and the reason for that is the A201 is the sort of background document to the whole family of documents. Uh, if you're talking about, say, uh, the B101, which is, uh, so B101 would be the the main owner architect agreement. Uh, there's a B104, B107, there's a bunch of different versions, but the B101 is sort of the standard um, for a reasonable size project. Uh, the B B101 will have quite a bit of information that's not actually in the B101. It uses the A201 as a reference. So in the B101, it'll say, oh, and by the way, this contract includes the A201. And then the A101, which is the big main standard uh, owner contractor agreement, does the exact same thing. It'll say, uh, you know, a whole bunch of the specific contract information about this sp specific situation, but then it'll also say, oh, and by the way, the A201 is included in the A101, in this version of the A101. Uh, and then we could list off all the other contracts, uh, the subcontractor contracts, the consultant contracts, that they all reference in the A201. And that allows the definitions of uh, what does payout mean, the definition of what is a subcontractor, what is a consultant, um, all of the sort of background ideas uh, that don't need to sort of fill out uh, and make very dense uh, any one of the individual contracts it sort of allows all that to reside in a separate document that you only have to print the once and it works for all the other contracts and just makes life a, a bit easier. And it's uh, the sort of referred to as the general condition. So it's the all that other stuff. Now you can actually alter the A201 and then put initials by it and date it if you've altered it and things like that. Like it doesn't, it, it often will get uh, made specific to that specific situation, but it is not the contract. The contract is the B101, the A101, the other contracts, and the general conditions are referenced into the contract. Sorry if I messed up anybody's uh, night there with that. Oh, you're all right. Okay. Number four, choose the correct drawing order. Now, you'll actually find around the country and around the world, there are subtle variations on how this works. So uh, it's not um, super prescriptive. There are multiple ways that this can happen. And just because this is sort of a standard way of doing it doesn't mean that on any one given project you do this exactly. Sometimes there's sort of some weird thing that makes you want to change the order because there's another issue that's more important and you want to bring it forward or something. Like, you know, people do various things out in the real world. But from an NCARB standpoint, the idea is sort of what is the, what's the base way that we should imagine uh, how the, the order of the drawings should go so that everybody can figure out quickly how to find the information. You know, so you remember that like one of the main things that an architect does is actually communicate. So weirdly, uh, you know, we think of ourselves as designing spaces and all of that. But in fact, the, you know, when it really comes down to it, contractually what we're doing is we're making a communication tool between the owner and the general contractor. The general contractor's contract only makes sense 
by having a set of drawings and specifications attached to it. So the general contract uh, needs the contract documents that the architect puts together to fulfill that contract so that everybody knows what the point of the contract is. So if it's a communication tool between other people, well, then it needs to be able to be used as a communication tool. And so a subcontractor or a code official or a building owner, everybody needs to be able to know how to find information quickly. And one simple version of that is, well, if you kind of organize the drawings in the way that people expect them to be organized, they know how to find the information quickly and easily. And that's going to help in terms of it being a communication tool. And then there's a bunch of other issues about sort of standards of ways that different kinds of information are presented and uh, ways that dimensions are done and things like that. But this one issue is just to help make it possible for different people in different walks of life and different parts of the contractual landscape uh, to be able to kind of find the information that they're looking for quickly and easily. So what is the sort of general way this works? Well, the general way this works is that you're going to find there's going to be a title sheet. Uh, title sheet uh, often can be one sheet, could be 10 sheets, could be 30, 40 sheets for a very, very big project. So there's a title section um, on smaller projects, it's probably just one sheet. And that is sometimes called a T sheet, sometimes it's called G, sometimes it's called an A architectural sheet. Different people will, will use uh, different uh, ways of doing it, but the concept of the title sheet uh, will kind of give all that front information. Who's the owner? Who's the architect? Who's the GC? Uh, what's the address? What's the location of the project? Uh, what, uh, what code is being used? You know, sort of the big general things that uh, everybody would need to know. And then from there, we're going to go uh, eventually to all the architectural issues. But before we get to the A sheets, we're actually going to look at the stuff that happens before the full building part actually gets uh, designed, gets uh, not designed, but uh, constructed. And that's going to be the civil and the landscaping. So we're going to start with the title sheet, then we're going to go to the civil work. So civil engineering is all of that stuff about the site. It's all everything the way the civil engineers always describe it to me is six inches above the ground and down. So it's all the curbs, it's all the parking, it's all the underground piping, it's uh, the topography issues, it's storm drains, it's all of that stuff. So it's the stuff that kind of surrounds the building, if you will. And then the landscape also surrounds the building. Uh, and then once we get through with that stuff, now we're into the architectural uh, and we get site plans, floor plans. Uh, eventually we get to elevations. After elevations, we're gonna get to sections. Typically after sections, we'll have wall sections, so those kind of explanatory sections. And then uh, we'll eventually get into interior elevations and details and schedules and all of that. So there's a set way of that the architectural drawings will be laid out uh, to sort of make logical sense so that people can find it. And once we're done with the architectural uh, sheets, then we're going to start getting into our consultants' uh, information. Uh, and we're going to start with structure. So the structural drawings will come right after the architectural drawings. There are lots more potential consultants, uh, and so there could possibly be a logical consultant that would get fit in between the architect and the structures, but they're not going to ask you about some esoteric, uh, very, very specific uh, consultant. Uh, it'll be some of these sort of more straightforward ones. So after architecture, it's going to come structures. So the foundation details, all of that. Then you're going to get into the uh, framing plans and how the framing is done. Then you're going to get into the uh, details that are the structural details. So all of that stuff will, will go in the logical order in the structural section. And then we're going to get to the uh, MPE. So that's going to be mechanical, plumbing, and electric. Now sort of oddly, most people actually refer to it as MEP, uh, Mechanical Electric or Plumbing. But uh, most places around the country will actually do it in the order MPE. Uh, I have seen it uh, done both ways um, uh, in exam prep. Uh, so it may be enough of the time that it's MEP that that's OK. Uh, but it would only be one of those two. Uh, it wouldn't be, uh, you wouldn't put E first or something like that. 
So I would suggest that you think of it as MPE. Uh, and when we look, we find D is the one that uh, meets all of those issues. So if we uh, take a look at C, uh, we have architecture and then electric and plumbing and mechanical before structures. That doesn't make it, uh, sense in terms of the flow of information. If we look at B, uh, we have uh, uh, landscape uh, happening after the architecture. If we look at A, uh, we have civil after uh, structures, which also, again, doesn't really make any sense. Uh, so it seems a little crazy to, to say there's a specific order. Like I said, different people will do different things in different locations. Uh, but if you're trying to make it a communication tool, you're going to use some system like this in order to make it so that people can find the information quickly and easily. All right, I think we're at 21 right now. Holding strong. All right, go team go. Let's see, how about number five? You realize there is a mistake on the bid set, you should. A, issue a change order. B, issue a constructive change directive. C, issue an addenda. D, issue a memo and log it in the design log. So the key piece of information here uh, is that it's talking about you are in the middle of the process with the bid set. Uh, so the assumption here is that the bid set is at play, uh, meaning you've gone through schematic design, design development, you've gone through the contract documents phase, uh, you are now at a spot where you have a, you've put together all the bid information. You might be also going into permit at this point, uh, you might uh, be doing the bid set first and then go to permit after that. Uh, but the idea here is that you have a package of information that you've put together for the contractors to bid on. So there is no GC yet. Uh, and if there's no GC, that means there's no contract with a GC. One of the bidders presumably will bid uh, an amount that will make sense and that the owner and you will, you will help the owner to choose those bidder, choose the bidder. Uh, and hopefully one of them will come back with an amount that makes sense and you'll choose one and they will become the GC and they will uh, eventually get a contract with the owner. But if you're in the midst of the bid set, that's not what's happening yet. If the bid set exists, that means it's been put together and has been given out to people to, for, to bid on. So is it A, issue a change order? Well, what would you be changing if you issued a change order? you would be changing a contract. The change order is a change to the contract. So it changes the price or the scope or uh, the schedule of the contract or all three or two of the three or whatever. But it changes those three issues of a contract. Well, if we don't have a contract with a general contractor yet, it can't be A. So A is not possible because there's no contract yet. We're still in the bid phase of the process. How about B, issue a construction change directive? Well, construction change directive is a really fascinating process. If you're in the middle of construction, let's say uh, the contractor uh, is in the middle of, uh, uh, has just finished putting down the concrete for the foundations mm -hmm. and is bringing in a bunch of steel to erect a frame uh, and some issue comes up where it turns out that uh, something was, uh, there was a mistake on something or some problem and uh, there needs to be a change made. And the change is not that big a deal. It's probably about a thousand dollar change, something like that. And you uh, create a change order with the, the contractor and the contractor says, all right, uh, instead of it being a thousand dollars, I'm gonna say, uh, let's make that $50,000. And you're like, whoa, wait, that's, that's way too much for this change. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, you know that we can't we can't afford that. It is, that's not that's not reasonable. And the contractor says, "Well, I don't care. I'm just going to make it fifty thousand dollars." Well, you're not going to sign that change order because that's not a reasonable number. And you would tell the owner, "Don't sign that. Like we this we need to find a way to get this price down." So what would you do? Well, instead of issuing a change order, you would issue a construction change directive. And a construction change directive is essentially a change order that doesn't get signed. It's a change order where you say, look, I understand we don't agree on the price. We are going to bump the issue of this down the road and we're gonna start a process 
depending on what contract type you have, either with mediation, with arbitration, or go straight into litigation uh, to challenge this number. But in order to keep the project going, we're going to have you still do the work. And then whatever, if we do it through an arbitrator or something, and they say, really, 50,000, that's, that's crazy. But 1,000, that was way too low, too. How about 5,000? Well, OK, then the project is done by this point, and you pay the 5,000 instead of the 50,000 and instead of the 1,000. Uh, so it's a way of bumping the cost issue of a change order down the road, but keeping the project going. Because otherwise, if you're going to stop and wait for an arbitration process or litigation or anything like that, you might have everybody standing around for a year or two uh, before that gets worked out. And that just doesn't make any sense. So uh, in certain situations, pretty rare, it doesn't happen all that much, but in certain situations when the negotiations just aren't going anywhere but you need to keep the project going, instead of a change order, you would do a construction change directive. But you've probably noticed it's essentially a change order system, which means that there has to be a contract, that means there has to be the GC and not just bidders. So that one also isn't the right answer. So what would you do? You would answer C, issue an, agenda, an addenda. An addenda happens all the time. You should essentially expect that if you produce a bid set, you're also going to be producing an addenda. An addenda is any change you notice, your mistakes that, that come up, or uh, questions that come back from the various bidders, and they put together, you know, they have their own questions. You never answer directly to a bidder when they ask you a question. You put down a list of their questions, and you make an, an exhaustive list of all the questions from all the bidders, and you put together an addenda, which is a list of those questions and the responses. But it doesn't have to be just questions. It could be mistakes you found, anything, anything you're doing to change the bid set. And then when you issue that addenda, it actually becomes part of the bid set. So if you're talking about during the bidding phase and there's a change to be made, you're talking about addendas. And then D is kind of interesting. Issue a memo and log it into the design log. That would probably also happen. It's just that that's a secondary issue to kind of keep track of any of the design issues and to keep uh, potential litigation issues down the road uh, at bay. Uh, so that's just something you would do with really any change that comes up is just kind of keeping track of it. Uh, so it's got a date and all of that, that uh, when that issue came up. But the one that's the key thing here is that bid sets have addendas. Once you have a contract, they have changes. They have change orders. Down to seven, or 19, I think. 19, right? 19. Number six. In the B101, so remember that's the owner-architect agreement, this is sort of standard one. In the B101, there is a place for additional services. Which of the following might you find in that list? So when you sign a sort of standard contract like a B101, Often there's like you make little changes to it, you know, maybe the owner doesn't like some wording or uh, maybe there's a specific situation that you need to add a little bit more information in and, and you put all the specifics of what the project is and which uh, consultants are going to be included and things like that. So there's a bunch of stuff that you do, you alter it in very specific ways. But then there's a couple of potential sort of big ways to alter it. Uh, and they try to build it in so that you can do that easily without having to kind of write a whole section uh, and you know, take out big portions of the existing contract. So there's this idea of the basic services that the B101 or any of the contracts have a series of basic services. And then there's a whole bunch of other services that are typical enough that they would list them out in the contract but you have to specifically go ahead and mark them and say, yes, this is part of this contract. These are the additional services to the basic services that we're including into this contract. So they're listed in a big list. Uh, you can check them. Uh, and then once you check them, they're now considered part of this contract. Uh, then there's a few big open spaces where you can add other additional services that don't show up on that list. But for the most part, most of the things you would normally include show up on the list. So a very important concept from the contract standpoint is this sort of bifurcation of basic services from additional services. 
Additional services are not crazy unknown things. They're typical things that come up all the time. They're just not always in every contract. Whereas the basic services are always in every contract. So let's look at what our possibilities are here. We have landscape design, we have coordination with engineers, we have interior design, we have reviewing payouts, we have marketing materials, and design build services. So first off, one that I want to remove right away is we're definitely not going to be including in uh, additional services, design build services. And the reason for that is that is actually an entirely different project delivery method. You wouldn't use the B101 for that. The B101 uh, is not set up uh, to be a design build contract. It's set up to be an owner architect contract. If you want design build, it changes literally every word in the contract. So you just wouldn't use a B101 and then add as additional services design build. Now it's possible, I'm, I'm sort of stating that strongly, it's possible, I've actually done ones where we added design build for like a piece of furniture or uh, a small little situation within a larger contract. But you know, in general, you wouldn't use design build services as an additional service uh, inside a B101. So that one's definitely not it. So then the question comes, well, which of these are basic services and which of these are additional services? Reviewing payouts, you are expected to review payouts. So part of the basic services uh, in the standard contracts is that you are going to help the owner understand the progress of the construction. Now you can take that out if there are certain times when maybe they have their own employees who can handle that or something, but typically assumed as a role of the architect would be that you would help review the payouts. So the contractor is going to monthly say, could be every two weeks, could be every two months, could be at milestones, whatever. Typically it's monthly. The contractor is going to hand in a, a payout request. Uh, they're going to say, yeah, you know, we're a third of the way through the project and here's uh, how much money we expect to get at this point. And you as the architect are going to review that information so that you can help the owner understand what's going on, whether it's a reasonable payout request, and then you're going to help them uh, go through that process and then pay the contractor. So that would be considered part of the basic services, so it's not part of the additional services. How about coordination with the engineers? Nope, that's also assumed to be part of the basic services. Mm -hmm. That the consultants are generally considered to be part of your team, and so your team's coordination is part of the basic idea of what the owner is contracting when they sign a B101 with you. That you're supposed to be uh, coordinating uh, does the structural plan match to the architectural plan, match to the mechanical plan, et cetera, et cetera? Does it all fit together? Uh, all, do, are we doing the same, um, are we all doing lead or are we all doing something else? Like you're, you're the one who's coordinating that and that's part of the basic services. Now again, you can cross out if maybe the owner has their own engineers and they don't expect you to be doing the coordination. Well, you can just cross it out of the contract if you want, but it is assumed to be part of the basic services. So that leaves us with landscape design, interior design, marketing materials, and there's a whole bunch of other things. And if you start thinking about it, it makes perfect sense. You know, let's say you're doing a set of condos for a developer. Uh, who should do the marketing drawings? Well, you have a ton of information, you're ready to go, you're thinking about it from all those standpoints. It kind of makes sense for you to produce those marketing drawings, but it's also not a standard thing. It's not you know, something that you would absolutely do on every project, but there makes sense that you would have a little spot where you could say, yes, and we're also gonna be producing marketing drawings, and then you could describe what, uh, what you're expecting to produce. Um, maybe it's a model, maybe it's uh, 3D imagery, maybe it's uh, floor plans for use to hand out to potential customers. You know, there's lots of different ways that that material might be understood and you could define that in the contract, but that's a very typical additional service. Uh, and if you don't actually add it in, 
uh, if you just sort of, or if you don't realize that it's been added in, you could find yourself producing an awful lot of hours worth of marketing materials that you weren't expecting and didn't have enough money in your fee for if you aren't sort of watching out for that. Uh, interior design is kind of an interesting one because uh, architects sort of always think that they are doing interior design, but there's always another level to the interior design. Like so, for example, uh, uh, really understanding all of the furniture. Are they going to buy all new furniture? Is the architect choosing all of that? Are they coordinating with the the salespeople about uh, when it's going to come and, uh, and uh, how many chairs and how many desks of each and all of that? Uh, there's sort of an extra level of specificity that comes with interior design about all of those kinds of issues. Uh, maybe paint colors and things like that might also be part of that. Uh, landscape design. Uh, landscape design can be part of the basic, uh, uh, but typically is considered an additional service. So there you go, very important concept, the differences between basic and additional services. All right, that brought us down to 12 people who still have... Uh, Are in the running? 100% right. Okay. This one's a little weird. Um, let's give it a try. You and the owner are reviewing the bids for a manufacturing laboratory building that is already running behind schedule. One bidder is highly qualified for the technical laboratory portions of the project, but they have no experience in the highly contentious community work that seems likely to get the project passed. Another bidder is significantly lower than all the others, but no one really likes or trusts them. They don't, they don't like the, the package that they put forth that shows that they can do this project. A third bidder has great experience doing sensitive community projects, but has never done a lab building before, all the technical aspects of a lab building. What might you say to the owner to help them think about this process and what they could do with this information? So A, we have suggest a loose relationship with the firm that has good community reputation hourly, but actually choose the one that has the lab experience because that is the hard part. B. Propose a multiple prime delivery system. C, rebid the drawing set to find a GC firm that actually meets the needs of the owner. D, it does not matter, you have to use the lowest bid. Now, there are actually situations where you are required to use the lowest bid. Uh, in certain kinds of government work, uh, that can be a requirement. Most of the time these days, because there's been some spectacular disasters over the years where people didn't understand uh, what they were actually bidding on and ended up uh, bankrupting their own companies and projects went haywire, there's usually a way of getting out of using the lowest bid um, these days. But there, like I said, sometimes, in, especially in certain government work, there are actually rules that you have to take the lowest bid because they want to protect the taxpayer. Uh, but it doesn't actually say that it's government work, and so you shouldn't assume that. And in fact, most of the time uh, when you are uh, going through a bid process, if you're not in one of those situations, one of those specific situations that are ruled by uh, legal understanding, so government work would be the main one, uh, the owner can actually choose any bidder they want. They can decide not to choose a bidder. They can, uh, they can do whatever they want. They're the owners, their project. They can make whatever decision that they want. Your role through that process is to help them make decisions. So D is not the correct answer. Uh, C, rebid the drawing set to find a GC firm that actually meets the needs of the owner. That might be something you would tell the owner. That's a very good answer. The only problem with that answer is if you look at the first sentence, we're already behind schedule. So what that means is you would be literally redoing the entire bidding process. The information in the question is leading us to say, that's just not gonna work, it's not gonna fly. So while close, I'm gonna say C doesn't quite work even though it's probably the best idea overall if you weren't behind schedule. And then we have A and B. Su suggest a loose relationship with the firm uh, that does the good community work, uh, get them hourly. That's plausible, but a, probably a better answer is B, which I just crossed out, uh, B, which is propose a multiple prime delivery system. So this is a project delivery system where you have more than one essentially GC. 
So instead of having one full GC that oversees the whole project, you actually have multiple GCs. You wouldn't call them GCs, you'd call them prime contractors, uh, but they're essentially individual GCs, and they have certain sets of responsibilities. Uh, and so in this case, probably what you would do is have the shell uh, and core of the building done by the, the team that is good at doing work that fits in well with the community and kind of can get all that stuff passed. And then you'd have the other firm do all the technical work uh, for the laboratory because that's what they're really good at. This is something that happens all the time on uh, university projects, on big scale projects, on technical uh, things that like, uh, you know, highly technical manufacturing. Uh, there's all sorts of times when you actually separate out different aspects of the project in order to get the best out of each of the individual, um, in this case, contractors. It might be the same exact conversation with architects. All right. Down to nine. Number eight. During a preliminary walkthrough, you notice a nine by nine floor tile that looks suspiciously like an asbestos tile from the 1950s. You should, A, Research asbestos and present the owner options. B, propose encapsulation, which would be covering it over uh, and leaving it there. C, suggest that they get a phase, this is, sorry, there's a little typo in here. That should be phase one. A phase one review done. And D, run the other way. So given the typo, I'm not sure what to say about uh, uh, if there's any issues for folks, but um, so D, run the other way, great answer. Um, and if you're talking to your insurance, uh, they would absolutely say run the other way. Uh, architects really got uh, burned very, very badly uh, back way back in the like late 60s, 70s, and 80s uh, dealing with toxic materials. Uh, many architects got sued and things went very badly. And so all the insurance companies essentially asked everybody to just, all right, don't get involved. Uh, except the way that the architects get involved is by uh, reviewing the information that specific pr professionals will provide who are environmental uh, professionals. And they'll provide the information. And then the architect's role is to help navigate what that actually means to the project and to the owner. Uh, whether they need to get uh, work done, uh, whether they need more information, whether we will encapsulate or what, all of that. So uh, let's look at the answers again. Research the asbestos and present the owner options. Uh, actually, uh, while that's a good idea and you should do that, you actually don't really want to be the one out in front presenting the options to the owner. Uh, you're not the one who has the research done already. You're not the one who wants to take responsibility for the environmental issues. So it's not going to be A. Propose encapsulation. Encapsulating a 9x9 nine nine floor tile, uh, putting a new flooring over the top, that's actually probably a great idea. It happens all the time. It seems weird to leave asbestos in a building, but if you think about the idea that you're gonna remove all of that asbestos, you're gonna break it all up and you're gonna pull it out and you're gonna throw it into a truck that's then gonna take it some, you're actually disturbing the asbestos significantly more and much more likely to get it out uh, and the fibers into the air and actually cause a problem by pulling it out than you are by just covering it over in a sort of serious way that will uh, sort of hide it for a good long time. So encapsulation, great idea. But again, why are you making that decision? Uh, it shouldn't be the architect being out in front on the environmental issue like this, the uh, toxic environmental issue like this. So uh, while it's a good idea, it might be something that you do, it's not the thing that you're gonna say in this moment. Uh, and run the other way is obviously a bit of a joke, um, but uh, you know you can't run the other way. Uh, you have a project to work on, so what do you do? You're going to suggest a phase one. So what this is, a phase one, uh, is when uh, specific environmental engineers who have specific training 
will go through uh, an existing site. There might be already a building there. There might be just an open site. Uh, and they will take a look and they'll do a quick search uh, that looks to see, well, what has been on that site? Uh, you know, was there a dry cleaner there? Was there a printing press that had lots of solvents and things like that? Was there a gas station? They'll look at the history of the site and do a, maybe a walkthrough. Sometimes they don't even actually walk through, they'll just look at photos. So it's a fast paced sort of version of like, does it look like there might be any problem? And if there's a problem, then they'll say what they think the problems are and they'll propose uh, what, those, uh, what the next steps might be. And it might lead you to obviously a phase two and a phase two is where those same folks will go through and they'll actually test everything and they'll go through it all and they have a big big long report but you wouldn't want to go to the phase two straight off because if they don't really need to test everything what's the point so phase one is a way of kind of having a fast paced like real professionals looking at it who are uh, highly knowledgeable about the information, making quick decisions about whether it needs to go on to the phase two. Uh, so what you are going to do is you are going to suggest that the owner gets a phase one. And then from there, the phase one and the phase two would include suggestions. And those suggestions from those professionals are what you would use to then influence your drawings and your specifications, et cetera. So like C how, is like, the answer. I like how official run the other way looks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's actually a great answer. Like I said, if you talk to your, uh, <laughs> talk to your insurance professional. It's not a great answer. Yeah, right? they, they would be like, absolutely, run the other way. Uh, they really don't want you to talk about uh, asbestos or anything like that. Because like I said, uh, they remember way back to the 70s when uh, many architects went out of business because of it. Huh. All right, number nine. When would a cost plus contract type for the architect's fees make sense? Choose three. So the choices we have are when the project is a hospital, uh, simple rote projects that are likely to be very repetitive, for example, small tenant layouts for a building owner, that, you know, some building that has many tenants in it and they change over a lot. C, highly unusual projects. So for example, a superstructure for a large scale artist installation that has many hard to define elements at the time of the contract. D, a project type that has never been done before. E, a single family house. F, government work. So essentially a cost plus is a situation where uh, you are going to say, this is all of our costs that we've gone through to do this project for you. And the plus is we also want uh, a little bit of profit at the end. So you're essentially saying, you know, it took us X number of hours this is how much we charge per hour, this is all of our other costs, and you're gonna give us 8% uh, uh, profit, something like that. When would you want to do a cost plus? Well, the kind of main answers to that are gonna be, uh, like imagine you're saying to an owner, hey, don't worry about it, we're gonna do this uh, hourly. You know, you will start now, and every hour we spend on it, we'll charge you for. Don't worry about it, it's all good. Well, the owners obviously are going to be a little nervous, right? Because you could do hourly forever and just keep charging them and keep making the drawings more and more detailed or something. And there's no end point, right? So there's lots of projects where that just doesn't make any sense. And so cost plus just isn't the right way to deal with it. But if you think about it from the other way, imagine a situation where there's a very, there's a whole lot of unknowns. Right? What would you do as an architect if you were in that situation where you had to put a fee number on a situation that you just couldn't tell exactly what was going to happen? Well, you would put a very big fee just to kind of cover yourself. And then if everything went really simply and smoothly, you'd still get that big fee whether you needed all that extra money for time or not. And so in those situations, that's when it makes sense to be working on that kind of hourly basis because then it makes sense from the owner's standpoint, they don't want you to just cover yourself and add 50% to your fee uh, because you just, you're not sure. They want in that situation, just do it hourly and we'll give you a reasonable profit on the top, but you have to prove to us you're hourly. So it's a huge amount of paperwork that you go through in order to make that uh, understandable to the uh, clients. Uh, so, which projects does this make sense? So, clearly, highly unusual projects, 
uh, for this example of the artist installation. Uh, a project that's never been done before, that's totally a reasonable answer because a project that's never been done before, like, well, if there's some like highly new technological thing that nobody's ever tried before, you would cover yourself. You would want to make sure you had enough money in your fee. If anything went wrong, that you could keep keep working on it. That's a perfect thing to be doing as an hourly cost plus idea. And then the flip of that is simple rote projects where there's just sort of a relationship. You're going to have one, and you're going to flip that out. It takes a couple of days. You then get another one. Really, you're going to stop and make like full on. Uh, proposals for a three-day project. Uh, you're going to have uh, back and forth in normal way. No, you just they're just going to say, all right, we got another one for you. You know, it's unit uh, F now. And so you're going to sit down, you're going to do unit F, you're going to keep track of your hours, you're going to give them the cost plus of a fee, and there you go, it's done. So those are the kinds of things that fit well with cost plus. All the other ones could be a cost plus, but there's no reason, there's no compelling reason in an abstract sense that they would be. Down to two. Oh my God, it's nerve wracking. <laughs> this is a very odd one. Uh, it's an important concept, but it's very odd when you think of it abstractly and it goes against every fiber of your uh, drawing sort of style. Interior dimension strings should have a dimension missing, A. B, always use full integers. C, be placed right in the center of the plan for legibility. D, should be taken to the studs, not the drywall finish. This is uh, an interesting one. I'm gonna talk about D sort of quickly. Uh, if you imagine, if you're doing your dimensions and there's a stud in plan and there's the drywall on it, maybe it's a metal stud, maybe it's a wood stud, I've just drawn a wood stud. Uh, if you imagine this place before anybody's done the framing, so it's just a floor platform uh, and now the framers are gonna come in and put everything in place, it totally makes sense to have the dimension go to the stud. Because that's what they're putting up. That's the thing that they're installing. And so that dimension going to the stud, going to the structure, is sort of a totally reasonable, logical thing to do. Uh, so in this case, we might have something like this, and it would say three and a half inches right there, because that's a two by four. Uh, so that's a completely reasonable way to go. In fact, in my early days in the, out in the world, uh, one of the guys I was working for was really very, very knowledgeable architect. I learned a huge amount from him, and he said, this is absolutely the way to go. This is what you must do, because this is how it makes sense when it's being built. And so I started doing this. And then when I actually got out in the field, all the carpenters who had gotten used to how most architects do it, which would be to the finish, let's say it's half inch drywall, just to make it easy. So most architects do that, and so the carpenters have just gotten used to it, and so they just add everything up and subtract it in their heads, and they kept making mistakes even though the thing that I was doing was trying to make it easier for them. Uh, so you'll find people do this uh, to the structure sometimes, other people do it to the finish. It doesn't really matter as long as it's consistent on the set. It, you never want to switch back and forth. You always want to make sure that it's consistent on the set. So while D is an interesting discussion, uh, it's not the answer that we're uh, looking for. Uh, how about B, use full integers? Really? Like you can't have a half inch dimension? That's not it. Uh, how about C, be placed right in the center for plan, uh, of the plan for legibility? Well, maybe the center is actually the least legible. Maybe there's a lot of walls in the center of the plan. Being in the center or off center doesn't really have anything to do with it. Legibility is a good issue, but the being in the center mm, doesn't really mean anything. So the answer actually is have a dimension missing. Now that is a very strange thing. You start to imagine this idea that I have this string of dimensions. Uh, so let's say we've got uh, 
nine foot there. We've got uh, four foot there, uh, two foot uh, right there. And then, I don't know, what's that, 11 feet? And how about uh, eight? And here's our outside wall, and here's the other outside wall. So what's the problem with just having that string go all the way through? Well, the problem is, what happens if there's a mistake somewhere? What happens if when they were putting the foundation in back on the first day of the project and it started raining and they made a little mistake and they're an inch and a half off with the foundation? Or uh, a code official has said, uh, no, I want you to put in uh, another exhaust fan and so one of the walls got thickened out uh, in the process. Something changed, something was a mistake, there was some problem. Well, if it turns out that it's really important that you've got this 11-foot dimension, maybe there's a piece of cabinetry that fits exactly in that 11-foot, or there's an accessibility uh, dimensions that you really need to have that 11-foot, then you know if we're an inch and a half off, it by just happenstance and Murphy's Law, you're going to end up with, instead of 11-foot uh, there, you're going to end up with 10, 10 and a half in reality. Because that inch and a half is going to come from somewhere. And so here's that situation where this is really important to have be 11, but it ended up being less than that just because of some mistake or some change along the way. So what you really want to do is you want to make sure that that number, that 11, is there so that this doesn't happen. Maybe the 8 is also important, so we're going to put that one in. Uh, maybe the two is important. Maybe that's showing the size of a closet or something. And maybe the nine is also, you know, reasonably important or not so important, but reasonably important. But maybe we don't really care that much about the four. Like if the four was four one or three eleven or three ten, would it really matter? Well, then don't put it in. So then that one's the one that we say we're going to take that one out. It just won't be in that string of dimensions. Why? because then that makes it clear to the contractor, to the carpenter, when they're doing their layout, well, this is supposed to be eight feet. This is supposed to be 11 feet. This is supposed to be two feet. This is supposed to be nine feet. This is the balance of whatever's left. Now, you may know that it's supposed to be four feet and it probably will end up being four feet but we all know that things change all the time on projects and that these things slide around. This is saying, nope, I got to have it be 11 feet. And in fact, you might even put a note that says, like this, this one's the key one, you know, like verify this and make sure that it's 11 feet. Uh, but that four foot one, we don't really care about it. So we're even taking it right out. And instead of saying four foot, we'll say balance or we'll just leave out the, the whole thing and just take it right out. So it's really hard when you're used to AutoCAD and things like that where you do the string and it literally leads you to doing a continuous string of these different numbers. You know, it's easy to count. You keep clicking all the way through. It's hard to think, wow, really I should go back and erase one of those? But in fact, uh, you never want to have it be a full string on the interior all the way from one end to the other end uh, of the building. Because if you do, when that mistake happens and you know there will be mistakes or changes or whatever, uh, you are at the, the hands of the gods about whether that, uh, the alteration that ends up inev inevitably coming happens to be in a place where you don't mind it being uh, a different dimension. So it's a weird concept, but with interior dimensions, you always leave one of the dimensions missing from a full string. Exterior dimensions, you can also do the same thing, but somewhere on the plan there needs to be the overall dimension. So you don't have that same uh, kind of rule in an exterior set of dimensions uh, because you need to be able to show the overall and what the column grid spacing and things like that are. How about that? That's a weird one. Uh, if you haven't heard that before, that probably threw you a little bit. Yeah, I think someone wrote grr in there. Yeah, in there, in there yeah. In it's an important response. concept though because it, it shows that you understand the difference between uh, the sort of conceptual world of the drawings 
and the reality of getting something constructed. It's a, it's a big deal and it's an important, uh, it's an important concept for uh, an architect to be able to uh, explain and to uh, show that they understand that to both code people, owners, everybody, to contractors. So it's a, it's, it's a weird little one, but it's actually a key understanding of that difference of the conceptual drawings and the reality of a, a built environment. Okay, cool. Um, so hey, I'll, uh, we have a couple of questions here. Uh, if you had some, a burning question, uh, we, can, we can try to capture a couple of them. Um, Andrew asks an interesting question on question seven, if there are two prime contracts and each general blames the other for work done sort of in a substandard way, uh, won't that make the project schedule increase? Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, you are absolutely right. That's the big issue with a prime contract, uh, with, with that kind of project delivery. Uh, and you would have to manage that uh, very, very carefully. Uh, so if that goes bad, then yep, that's absolutely true. But when you choose to do a prime, a multiple prime contract, which by the way, doesn't have to be two, it could be three, four, uh, at some point it gets a little ridiculous. You wouldn't, you'd probably do some other, you'd probably do a construction manager or something if you got to five or six, but uh, often it's three. Uh, that if you are doing a multiple prime uh, contract delivery system, like the big issue would be coordination and communication between not just the contractors and the owner and the architect, but between the contractors. And so hopefully you'd be doing that right and that the contracts would be done right. Okay. Um, Maria asks an interesting question. How is it that on the B101 coordinate with owners, uh, the cons consultant is an additional service? Isn't this misleading with consultants and engineers? Uh, I'm not quite sure if I understand, but let me just, uh, so the issue is that it is part of the basic service. So if there are consultants, you are assumed that you are coordinating them. Um, now, if somebody else, if the owner has their own engineers or other kinds of consultants or something, uh, typically, even if it's not your consultants, you're still responsible for coordinating all of that work unless you specifically alter your contract to say, hey, look, you've brought your own, I don't know, interior designer or your own lighting consultant or your own kitchen consultant or something. And you know, I don't understand what, what what they're up to. I'm not consult. I'm not going to be coordinating their work, and I'm going to put that into the contract. They'll have to coordinate themselves. Well, that's fine. You can change the contract in any way you want. But typically, one of the main basic roles of the architect is you're doing the design, your the design intent, but you're also coordinating everybody else's uh, work to make sure it's also in that same design intent. So basic assumption is that the consultants are coordinated by the architect. All right, and then um, maybe lastly here, Jed asked in a question, and I, I'm not sure exactly which one this was for. It might've been seven, it might've been uh, eight. Uh, his question was, would that separation for multiple primes need to be spelled out before bidding? Uh, technically you would, um, but this is uh, the situation where often what happens when you get a series of bids, you would actually then go into what's referred to as a negotiation phase. So uh, if you look kind of closely, we, we, got, we consider that part of the bid process, um, so it doesn't have its own separate sort of timeline, uh, but any bid process, there's the assumption is there's the bid set produced, uh, it goes out to a number of different bidders. Uh, at some point, there's an addenda produced, maybe a second addenda. If things are going badly, maybe a third or fourth addenda. Uh, this is some series of addendas. And then eventually the bids are all brought back in. Uh, and there's a review of the bids with between the owner and the, uh, with the architect helping the owner understand them. Maybe other people, funders and other people might be involved in that. Uh, and then there's uh, built in is the idea of a negotiation phase. So what that means is there's this moment where you say, okay, we're choosing bidder B. Uh, so that's who, who we're choosing. But before we say, you know, before we hand them a contract, we're going to look at their, their actual bid and we're going to realize, wow, this is really expensive for the flooring that they put in their bid. Or this is really, you know, we put the, uh, 
uh, a couple of add alternates and uh, some deduct alternates uh, in the bid set and uh, their uh, bid made us really realize we, we don't want to do the ads or, or wow, we can really afford all that. So there's a whole process of negotiation and in this case that would really be uh, that the negotiation would fall, would be what we would where we would talk about the whole prime concepts idea. All right, all right, good deal. Well, we're going to stop here. Uh, so I just want to thank you, Mike, um, and thanks to everyone who's tuned in and submitted their questions today. Uh, as we said earlier, if you'd like to attend our next ARE live broadcast, where we'll have a discussion about ARE 4.0. Site planning and design mock exam review. You can go to blackspectacles.com slash podcast to register to attend. You know, I also just put it in the, um, the GoToWebinar chat box and tried to put it in the, uh, in the question uh, area as well. So uh, if you want to register for the next one, you can do that there. Um, and, you know, just like today's episode, you have a chance to ask questions and share your answers with Mike for live feedback during the broadcast. Um, to learn more about our ARE exam prep curriculum, you can go to blackspectacles.com where you can try out um, any of the free course videos. Um, and as I always like to say, if you want your boss to pay for your membership, be sure to visit blackspectacles.com slash firms to learn more, more about our firm memberships for firms of any size. And by the way, we just did a, um, uh, created a, a content piece where we're sort of sizing up firms um, to find out uh, you know, what kind of resources and not just resources, but how they're helping young architects or aspiring architects get licensed. Um, and one of our research pieces here was a study from Design Intelligence. Um, I think it was from 2016, had said that, I think it was 83, Clay, what was it? 83% of firms had provided, was it 83? Or 87, yeah. 83 or it was either, so let's call it 84 and a half <laughs> uh, percent of firms uh, reimburse folks for their uh, for their exam prep costs. Um, so uh, oh, that's like, much higher than I was expecting. I know. I I thought so too. Um, so if you're in one of those firms that isn't doing it, um, uh, send us a note and we can send you that uh, that study. Um, that number tends to go up and down a bit depending on the economy, mm -hmm. but yep. um, grab it while you can. Yeah. Um, so let's see. So if you wanted your firm uh, to pay for your membership, as I said, you can go to blackspectacles.com/firms uh, for those. And uh, let's see, for those of you who are ready to start preparing for the ARE right now, um, and if you're already an AI member, you can use the coupon code CDS92117YT to get a 15% discount for the entire duration of your ARE exam prep membership. And then uh, finally, tomorrow we'll send you an email follow-up about today's live broadcast. So please let us know what you think and share any suggestions you may have. Uh, we read every word that you write and use them to tune our next episodes. So thanks for watching.